Good afternoon, everybody. On this beautiful day, we had some good rain yesterday to help keep the pollen down, so hopefully everybody's allergies is feeling better, even though I still have allergies that I'm dealing with from, uh, from before, but nevertheless, I'm still here. I'm still showing my teeth, still smiling, and still ready to praise the Lord, amen? Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for uh, allowing the people to get here safely and people that's still coming, please protect them to be here as they proceed to come. Please, Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to keep our minds and our hearts open for the understanding of your word, for uh, everybody praising you, singing on one accord, sounding good to your ears and, and uh, making you happy, Lord. Please protect us from any distractions that the enemy want to throw at us and allow everything to be sweet to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good afternoon, everyone. May I request everyone to please rise so we can sing our praises to our most beautiful Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's sing our first song, Beautiful One. So wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully Your glory fills the skies, your mighty works displayed for all to see. The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to sing, how marvelous, how wonderful. Let's continue to sing our praises and remind ourselves how faithful our God is. God 
God brought out his people with a strong and mighty hand to look them out of slavery to behold the promised land. Mountains fled before them and the seas turned back and ran and they saw that he was good. sing our last song, let us reflect on how it is only by the grace of God that we can be saved and we can be free. i 
for our message and we pray for our annual church meeting later on i pray that you give us wisdom and guidance as we elect our deacons and our trustees In jesus name we pray amen good afternoon Welcome to uh, Philippine International Church, PIC. We're very, very glad that you have uh, come and joined us this afternoon to worship the Lord and, of course, to fellowship with one another later on. Praise God. We have a wonderful weather today, right? Yesterday was cold. Today is kind of hot, but we're still coming from a cold uh, Saturday, so it's still manageable. <laughs> but, of course, uh, summer is around the corner. Right? 
Uh, we praise the Lord. You know, I lo what, what I like about, uh, I really don't like win winter, okay? <laughs> what I like about the four seasons is you have this, you, you wait for three months and then you have a new season. You have another three months, you wait for another season, right? It's like you don't have to wait for the whole year. Every three months, you have this, uh, you know, different vibe. And uh, for me, that's nice, right? Uh, it also reflects the, the life that we have. We have seasons in our lives, different seasons in life. Some are like winter, some are like uh, summer, others are like uh, fall or spring. We just have to go through them, right? We know that in the end, after winter, a bitter winter, there will be spring. We always have that hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Shall we all uh, bow down our heads? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this afternoon that we can come and worship you. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful songs that you move people, your children, to write. Uh, enables us to have uh, uh, words, songs to sing to you. Reflects what's in our heart. Lord, we also thank you that we can open your word once again. We pray, God, that you will use your word to teach us. Use your word to uh, rebuke us, to show the things that we do wrong and to correct us. That's what you said in your word. And, uh, of course, to train us in all righteousness. That is not just knowing your word and understanding it, but really applying it to our everyday life. Because we don't want to be hearers only of your word lest we are deceiving your, ourselves. We want to be doers of your word. Pray God that we'll use your word to enlighten our minds and ultimately transform our lives. And we pray God that it will protect us from any distractions from the devil who will try, of course, to uh, snatch away the seeds of your word that will be sown into our hearts and minds. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come against you, evil spirits, and leave this place. Go where the Lord Jesus Christ sends you. You don't have any place in a house of God. Leave in the name of Jesus. Father, just protect us. Cover us, Lord God, with your protection. And we pray, God, for other brothers and sisters who are still on the way. Hasten their footsteps. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Let me ask you this question to start with. If you were to choose between living as a prince and living as a slave, what would you choose? Live as a prince or live as a slave? What would you choose? Oh, Pastor Rich, do you even have to ask that question? That's a no-brainer. Of course you will choose to be a prince. Why won't you? Right? Well, you might even say, is there really such a thing, Pastor Rich? I mean, does that happen in real life? You choose between being a, uh, you know, a prince and a slave? Doesn't often happen often, okay? It rarely happens, but it did happen. Thousands of years ago, actually, there's an actual prince who was faced with this kind of choice. And surprisingly, he didn't choose as we would choose. <laughs> He chose to be with the slaves. His name? Moses. Why did he do this, you ask? Who would do that? He did. But why? Right? Look at me in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 26. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 26 in the New Testament. Uh, just three verses. Hebrews 11, 24, 26. Let me read it to you from the English Standard Version, or ESV. Hebrews 11, 24, 26. It says, By faith Moses, when he has gro was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Very short passage, but I tell you, this is very powerful. Now, you might ask me, Pastor, who was Moses? Who was Moses? I think in Hebrew, he's called Moshe. Who was Moses? Let me share with you some background so we will know, you know, where he come from, and we will appreciate 
why he made the decision that he made. Now, Moses was originally the son of a Hebrew couple. So he was Jewish. At the time, they were still called Hebrews. And uh, the, this couple were named Amram and Jochebed. Amram and Jochebed. So the father of Moses was Amram, and the mother was Jochebed. Both of them were Hebrew, and both of them come from the tribe of Levi. You know, the Israel, Israel had 12 tribes. One of them was the tribe of Levi. So Moses was from the tribe of Levi. Unfortunately, when Moses was born... He was born during the time when the people of Israel were living in Egypt as slaves. If you still remember your, your uh, uh, history, Hebrew history, you know that there was a time when Joseph, you know, the children of uh, the, uh, you know, I, uh, Jacob and his sons migrated to Egypt. There was a great famine during the time. They migrated there, and during the time, Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob, was already the prime minister, the highest leader in the la land only next to Pharaoh, the king of uh, Egypt. So they were treated very well for the sake of Joseph during the time. But, you know, that happened many, many years already before when, by the time Moses was born, that was like 400 years before around 400 years before. So that was a long time already. By the time Moses was born, the Israelites or the Jews or the Hebrews were no longer having that privileged position in Egypt. In fact, when Moses was born, they were already slaves to the Egyptians. Not only that, when Moses was born, there was a standing order from Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to kill all male children born to the Hebrew, to the Hebrews by being thrown into the Nile. So he lived. He was born into a very precarious, very dangerous time. Now you might ask me, Pastor, Rich, why would Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, make that command? Why would he command that all the Hebrew children, uh, specifically baby boys, would be thrown into the Nile? What? What's the problem? You see, during the time, the Egyptians noticed that the, the Hebrews were already becoming very, very many, to say the least. <laughs> Too many of them. And the Egyptians were thinking, boy, there are too many. I don't know if you had more Egyptians uh, or, 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 or Hebrews during the time. I don't know which one of them you know, had a bigger population. But definitely, the Egyptians will felt, uh, felt threatened so much so that they were worrying. They were thinking, maybe they will rebel against us. Maybe the Hebrews, when we are attacked by our enemy, they will, you know, go to the other side. They will take the side of our enemy and they will come against us. So because of this fear of the Egyptians, specifically of, of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he decided that he wanted to kill all the male babies of the Hebrews. And the way to do that was to throw them into the Nile. Okay? So they wanted to control the population growth, in other words. For the first three months, the mother of Moses, by the name of Jochebed, tried to hide him. But how long can you hide a baby? Right? <laughs> Once the baby... Christ, Wah! how can you hide? Right? <laughs> how can you hide? I don't know. It was really difficult. But they were able to hide the baby Moses for the, by the way, at the time, he was not yet known as Moses. This name Moses was given to him later. We will talk about that later. But at this point, let's just call him Moses because I don't know his original name. Baby Moses for the first three months was okay. But after that, you know, the baby was already grown, you know, a bit. The mom, Jochebed, could no longer hide him. So they decided as family, they would put him inside a basket. Of course, the basket was waterproof. And then they carried the basket with the baby inside, three-month-old baby, and put it on the River Nile and let it float there. I don't know what was their game plan. They really had a game plan. Of course, later on something happened, certain things happened, but we don't know if that was really the game plan. But, you know, they put the baby on the Nile River in a basket. 
Okay, while that's happening, the sister, the older sister of Moses, was uh, standing at a distance to see what would happen to the baby in a basket. So that day, the daughter of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, went to the river to bathe. Okay? And she saw, we're talking about a princess. Princess of Egypt, daughter of Pharaoh. When she was there, she saw the basket, and what, she was curious what's inside. And when she opened it, lo and behold, it was a baby boy. I could only imagine, maybe the, the boy, you know, baby Moses cried, and he looked so cute, right? That the princess took pity on him. And then, the sister, who was just standing at a distance, right away went to, to, the, uh, to the princess and said, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for me? Now, I don't know if this was a part of the plan, that they were thinking, Oh, I know the princess who comes to the river during this day at this time. So I don't know. But she was there. She was ready. So that when she saw the, the princess uh, taking pity on the, the baby Moses, she right away said, I mean, the sister of Moses right away said to the princess, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? The Bible tells us the princess agreed. And so the sister called their mother, <laughs> of course. They called their mother and the and the and the daughter of Pharaoh hired the mother of Moses to take care of him. Wow. We can only dream of that happening if you were in that situation. So many baby boys were killed by drowning. So this is like, you know, just trying their luck. Right? So the Pharaoh's daughter hired the mother to take care of Moses for some time. And the Bible tells us when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he was officially adopted as her son, making him heir to the throne. You have to understand that Pharaoh didn't have a son. And the princess cannot reign. Right? So since Moses was officially adopted by the princess, that made him the prince of Egypt. So he was, you know, heir to the throne. The daughter of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, named the baby Moses, which means drawn from the water. So Moses grew up in the palace, enjoying all the power and privileges of a prince. Imagine, you know, that's a great reversal of fortune, if you will, right? He was supposed to be drowned in the river to be killed just like the other babies. But he was saved. Not only was he saved, he grew up in the palace, became the heir to the throne of Pharaoh. Great life, right? Many years passed by. However, the Bible tells us, when Moses was already an adult, he decided to identify himself with the people of God, the Hebrews, and he decided that he would be willing to suffer with them. That was his choice. Look at me. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 25. Hebrews 11, verse 24 and 25. It says here, By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Now notice the verse. It says, By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He did not leave the palace because he had no choice. Really. He did not, you know, he wasn't kicked out of the line of those who will reign, right? But it was an active decision on his part. The Bible says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, if we will study the, the life of Moses, we won't know the, when did he say this, what did he do. We don't know if he, he did, made this decision when he was already 40 years old. 
Because when he left Egypt to go to the wilderness, he was already 40 years old. So we don't know if that was the only time he refused to be called the Pharaoh's son or the prince of Egypt. Or maybe even before that, you know, maybe before that he would already visit his people, the Hebrews, because he knew that he was a Hebrew. He was just adopted. Now, I don't know how he was able to get hold of that fact. But he knew. He knew who he was, although he was the prince of Egypt. Now, you have to understand that they looked differently. The Egyptians looked, you know, they wore, wore different clothes. Of course, the Jews, the Hebrews also wore differently. You know, when, you, when I say to you, Egyptian, what comes to your mind? Of course, you, you, you have an idea of what an Egyptian is like. How they dress. We know, oh, this is Egyptian. Oh, this is Hebrew. So they, they look differently. But Moses knew who he was. I don't know what part, at what point he started to know who he was. Because the Bible tells us, you know, he, his mother, Jochebed, took care of him until he wa he, she weaned him off. So at what age do you wean a baby? Maybe three years old, four years old, right? So he was still very young then. But he was taught early on who he was. But, you know, what can you remember? Can you remember what happened to you when you were still two years old, three years old, four years old? You can, right? <laughs> so I don't know what happened. Or maybe the mother, Jochebed, taught her faithfully during the formative years. That's what they call formative years. And then maybe, I don't know what happened. Along the way, when he, maybe when he already grew up, you know, he's a prince of Egypt. He had access to people. Maybe there was some whispering in a kingdom. Maybe some people talked to him, the Jews, and told him, you know what? You're adopted. You're one of us. I don't know. But definitely, by the time he was 40 years old and he left for the wilderness, for Midian, you know, he was already old enough to know all these things. That's why he defended. You will know later on. Okay? So it was uh, an active decision in, on his part. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. To be called the son of Pharaoh's, uh, to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter was, you know, a great thing. Right? Just imagine, you will be called the prince of Egypt, son of, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's a very privileged name, right? Wow, prince of one of the most powerful kingdoms during the time. Who wouldn't want that? But he refused, according to the Bible. He refused. He did not accept it. He didn't want to be called uh, the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Instead, verse 25, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. So instead of, you know, enjoying the fact that he was the adopted son of uh, the Pharaoh's uh, daughter, you know, he said, no, I would rather be mistreated with the people of God. Remember again, during this time, the Hebrews were already slaves in Egypt. No longer privileged. Now you might ask me, what happened? What happened, pastors? How did this all happen? So one time, this is what happened. One time, uh, according to the Bible, Moses visited his people. I mean the Hebrews. That's his original people. He visited with them. And he saw an Egyptian beating one of the Hebrew slaves. And so when he saw that, he didn't like it. He knew he was Hebrew. And you should not beat anyone, right? So what he did was he fought with the Egyptian. I don't know if he, act, he, he uh, intentionally did it, but ending, the Egyptian died. Okay? The Egyptian soldier got killed. And you know what happened? Later, to cut the long story short, later, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, discovered what Moses did and sought to kill him. So Moses fled and ended up in the land of Midian, becoming a shepherd for the next 40 years. The 
but I believe even before that he already decided he already refused right that's why he was willing to stick his neck out he was willing to defend a slave why would you defend a slave right but he was willing he did that because even before that he already knew who he was he believed in God he believed that he is a part of the people of God the chosen people of God and it's not right he would rather suffer mistreatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin so Moses you know could have turned a blind eye on what's happening to God's people and just enjoy his privileged life you know as a, a prince of Egypt he had so much power prince of Egypt he, he received so much the best education the best training all the pleasures that come with being a prince a royalty right but he didn't want that so the question is why did he choose to identify and willingly suffered with the Hebrews who were slaves why would he do that let's read again the passage Hebrews 11 24 to 26 Hebrews 11 24 to 26 it says here by faith Moses when he was grown up refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin he considered the reproach or the insult insult of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt for he was looking to the reward there are two, at least two reasons here. Why he chose to be mistreated with the people of God instead of just enjoying being the prince of Egypt. Number one, first reason why he was willing, uh, why, why he chose to identify and willingly suffered with the slaves, the Hebrew slaves. One, because by faith, Moses saw the fleeting nature of earthly pleasures. Again, because by faith Moses saw the fleeting nature of earthly pleasures. You know, the phrase uh, pleasures of sin does not refer only to lust. Usually when we say, oh, pleasures of sin, we right away think of lust, specifically sexual lust. It includes that, but pleasures of sin is more than just lust or sexual lust. The phrase actually describes a way of life that we today would call quote unquote successful this is the kind of life depicted here a, a, a life of position a life of honor a life of power a life of wealth a life of comfort and the like okay pleasures of sin pleasures that come from having position honor power wealth comfort and the like now he saw that these things were fleeting okay and that's true fleeting means temporary it won't last for all eternity it won't even last for a lifetime for many people for most people how many times we've seen people who were so powerful like they were gods and they started to act like they're gods only to be kicked out of power some of them even ended their lives you know they themselves ended their lives or some of them were killed talking about dictators who were so powerful right in the end they just died we don't even have to talk about you know dictators we just talk about people who were used to be rich and then later on they were no longer rich times change fortunes change these things are fleeting How about power uh, i mean honor you know comfort and many things now don't get me wrong having position in itself is not wrong having power in itself is not wrong having honor wealth comfort and so on and so forth are not wrong in themselves in the first place the bible tells us that god is the source of blessings right what's wrong is when we live for them how do we know that we are living for them 
the time that we spend for them. How much time are we spending for them? That's no, that, you know, we know that we are living for them. If our mind is always thinking of these things, of reaching these things, or achieving these things, if they have become the primary motive of our actions, so I'm going to make this decision, I'm going to position myself, I'm going to arrange my life so that I'll become powerful, I'll become rich, I'll become honor, I will have honor, and so on and so forth, then it has become wrong. It has become wrong. Because we don't live for these things. We live for God. Right? And our job is to just be faithful. We should be faithful with the resources that God has given us. Okay? We make sure that we s serve him faithfully. And if in the, uh, in, in, in the process that we are s being good stewards of our jobs, good stewards of our opportunities, God blesses us with money, power, position, fame, whatever, praise God. Okay? That's the decision of God. But we don't make that our primary purpose. If it comes, it comes. Many people are successful. They have money at the expense of their families. No time for children, no time for spouse. What for? Right? Worse yet, they have no time for God. At the expense of what? Right? Now, I know what I'm saying here is not easy to, to apply. I myself find it very difficult to apply. But in the end, we have to apply it. We have to live accordingly because life is not about us. Life is not about you. My life is not about me. It's about the Lord who gave me this life. I live for him. Right? I just focus on being a good steward of whatever is given me. Faithful worker, faithful husband, faithful wherever. And in the process, if God blesses me, that's it. If it doesn't, it's okay. Because in the first place, this life is short. I cannot bring all those things. And this life, we are just pilgrims. That's what the Bible tells us. We're just passing by. You don't, you don't really put everything on earth if you are just passing by. Ultimately, we all believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Our home is heaven. That's where we're headed. Right? So, Moses, by faith, saw the fleeting nature of earthly pleasures. And so, he says, yeah, I'm the prince of Egypt. Yeah, I'm next in line, but life is not about me. <laughs> These are all fleeting. They can come and go. The important thing is, you know, my relationship with God. So because of that, he identified with the people of God. He knew who he was. He identified with them, and he willingly, you know, suffered with them. Now, isn't this what God's word clearly teaches us? Look at me in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, it says here, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. So what is this world talking about? In this context, uh, when John says the world, he's talking about, it says here, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. So by the world, he means, you know, he's talking about the desires of the flesh, meaning the sinful desires of our sinful nature. Whatever that is, whatever we, you know, our sinful nature desires, that is the desires of the flesh. The world also refers to the desires of the eyes, you know, greed. We want more. You see this? You want to buy it. You see that? You want to buy it. You want all these things. That's desires of the, I mean, desires of the eyes, right? Materialism, being greedy, being materialistic, and pride in possessions. That's also 
that also refers to the word pride in possessions. Want to keep up with the Joneses. Others have it, we also want to have it. They have a house, we want to have a house. They have a car, we want to have a car. Or they have a Lexus, like at the Ailey, we want to have a Lexus, <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, she has it. <laughs> right? Pride in possessions, of course. These are all part of worldly thinking. It says here, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possession is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Did you hear that? All these things, power, possession, pos uh, possession position, honor, will pass away. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. That's how we abide. When we believe, we worship God through the Lord Jesus Christ and we live for him, we abide. Not like these things. Again, I'm not saying that having money, I'm not saying that having honor, position, possession, power, you know, honor, name it, I'm not in being successful in your career, I'm not saying that these are wrong things. God blesses us. God gives us talents to make money, gives us time, gives us opportunities, gives us success. So they are okay. But the problem is when we make them the primary goal of our lives. Again, how do we know if we sacrifice everything, our families, our relationship with God, and we are just fixating on this one part, not living a balanced life, that thing has become our God. That thing has become wrong now. Let me read to you Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11 through 11. I mean, verse 1 through 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. So the book of Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon, right? Son of David. This is what he said. Now, King Solomon had a reputation to be the wisest man in the whole world, at least at the time, because of the special wisdom that God has given him. So Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, it says here, and he says, I'm quoting Solomon, he said, I said in my heart, come now. He's talking to himself. He's talking to himself, okay? He said, I said in my heart, come now. I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity or meaningless. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. He was a builder. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. Again, this is King Solomon, okay? Very powerful, very wise very rich. Verse 5, I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. So he's not just making a swimming pool. <laughs> he's, he's making big, you know, pools to water the forest. You know, again, he's king, right? This, this is King Solomon. The king of the most powerful kingdom, the richest during the time. Verse 7, in Solomon still, he said, I bought male and female slaves, and I had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. So he was really rich. Verse 8, I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of men. Wow. You know how many wives he had? According to the Bible, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And he said, he mentioned it here. He said, I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines. 300 concubines on top of the 700 wives. He said, and this is how he described having concubines. 
Many concubines that delight of the children of men. So he's really emphasizing something here. He said, you know, talk about pleasure. I had it to the nth degree. And so he said, verse 9, So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. Imagine, do you, imagine if you have this kind of power. Whatever you see, whatever you want, you can get it. It was like that. He said, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. Verse 11, listen to this. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil or labor I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity, meaningless, and a striving after wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. That's what King Solomon said. He was not someone who was just sour graping. You know, sometimes you say, oh, I really don't like that. We just say that sometimes because we are not able to get it, right? So you are just sour graping. No, he was able to get all these things. He was the richest, the most powerful, the most famous, the wisest. I don't know how handsome he was, but David definitely was handsome. His father, right? I won't be surprised if he's handsome, right? David is handsome, but Sheba was beautiful, right? He had 700 wives, 300 concubines. He had everything. So he was not just sour grape thing, but he said, I tasted everything, vanity, useless, meaningless. Right? All these things are actually fleeting. And that's the reason why Moses, you know, was willing to let go of these things and instead identify himself with the people of God and fulfill the will of God. Now, to many people, all they see are earthly pleasures. And they've been blinded by the temporary benefits of these things. And honestly, I'm also very prone to that. I'm as human as anyone here. So when I look around, I also see many things. Right? I also see the cars. I also see the, 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 the houses. <laughs> I also see this or that. I see these things. So I'm very prone. And the, the sad thing is, you know, many times we are blinded by the temporary benefits of these things. And even Christians have been lured by these things. So if we are not careful, we will be lured. And then we are no longer willing to make sacrifices. Because many times doing God's will entails sacrifice. Fulfilling God's will means you will lie have to not do certain things. You will carve out time that you have devoted to those things to give to the Lord. Or maybe you will not take up that job, you know, that will big you, you know, give you something so big because you want to have your time still for serving the Lord for your family. Right? Many people are lured by these temporary things, but genuine faith in God gives us a different perspective. If we really believe what we're saying we believe, then we will have a different perspective, enabling us to see the truth about these things. I still remember the first time I went back, I went to China to meet our relatives. For the first time, I went to our ancestral village. That's what's good about, you know, China. You can find your relatives. Just go to the, your ancestral village. They're there. So I went there, first time to visit my relatives. And then so you were here in the, the office of their business, and we were talking to each other. And, uh, you know, gave them some news, some, you know, about my, our, our, our 
side of the family in the Philippines and yada yada. And then uh, the talk uh, uh, dire was directed to what's your job? So, of course, I don't know if you realize this, many in China actually, during the time of my father, many times, so, you know, if there is such a thing as the American dream, before there was such a thing as the Philippine dream for the Chinese. They wanted to go to the Philippines because there had so ma much opportunity in the Philippines. And in fact, not all of the Chinese who went there to the Philippines became rich, but many of them. They had a Philippine dream, right? So our relatives in China who have not been to the Philippines, you know, they all had this mindset. So they were expecting, you know, they, they asked me, so what's your job? I said, a pastor. What's a pastor? I said, pastor. And I explained my work. <laughs> and said, uh, <laughs> uh, they didn't know how to react. And later on, they said, oh, why? <laughs> because they were thinking that I would be like my dad, businessman. And like our rel other relatives in the Philippines, businessman. Because to them, it's all about money. Really. And he couldn't understand. On my own, I also couldn't understand it, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Why am I here? Right? Every one of us, you know, have to make our choice to live for God or not. If God calls you to be a full-time minister, that's it. But this thing is not only, this kind of calling is not only for pastors and missionaries. All of us have our own calling. All of us are called by God to live for him wherever we are. And because of that, you will, you, you should not be surprised, you will be called to make sacrifices in your own context. Just to prioritize him. Why can we do this? Why can I do this? Because we have a different mindset. We have genuine faith. This is not just all talk. Christianity, I believe, I ascend to it mentally. No! Genuine Christianity, genuine faith, believes and acts based on that belief. We make adjustments in our lives if we really believe it. So that's, that's the first reason why Moses chose to identify with the people of God, although it was very difficult and willingly suffer for God, because by faith, Moses saw the fleeting nature of earthly pleasures. By faith. Remember, by faith. Number two, another reason why he did that is because by faith, Moses saw the eternal reward for devoting himself to God and his purposes. Again, because by faith, Moses saw the eternal reward for devoting himself to God and his purposes. Let's go back to our passage again. Hebrews 11, verse 24 to 26. Hebrews 11, verse 24 to 26. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Verse 26, he considered the reproach of Christ. You know, being identified with the, you know, the people of God, specifically the Messiah, you know, brings insult, brings persecution, brings uh, reproach, right? But Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. So that's the second thing, that's the re second reason why Moses was willing to suffer, because by faith he saw the eternal reward for devoting himself to God and his purposes. Because of faith, Moses had an eternal perspective. Okay? He had a different mindset, different perspective. Specifically, it's an eternal perspective. I don't know if you've heard this, but the reason why some people, you know, like, will, would be willing to blow themselves up, like some Muslims, not all, but those who we see on TV, why would they blow themselves up? Why would they be willing to die, you know, blowing themselves up? Why? Like 9-11, why would they be willing to do that? Why? 
because of their belief. The eternal perspective. What's the per eternal perspective? Specifically, according to their teachings, if they blow themselves, uh, you know, they, they die in a jihad, holy war, they die as martyrs, you know, killing the enemies of Allah, they will be given, they will be rewarded by Allah with 72 virgins. That's not hearsay. That's what they're teaching. So I'm not going to comment on that, whether that's right or wrong, okay? But the thing is, because of their eternal perspective, because they believe that. They're willing to make sacrifices, right? To them, oh, I'm going to be assured of my, my place in the paradise. For sure, I'll be going to paradise straight because I died for Allah as a martyr. And I get these 72 virgins, I mean for the men. So Moses also had an eternal perspective. Of course, not about the 72 virgins. He had a different one. But essentially, it's the, the, the knowledge and the belief that when he, you know, he dies, he will be rewarded by God for his obedience to him. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Hebrews 11 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Again, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Moses had the faith. It's by faith. It's by faith that Moses saw the eternal reward for devoting himself to God and his purposes. He had this deep conviction in him. And it was difficult at the time, especially because he was not living among the Jews. He, he, he grew up in the palace of Pharaoh, which I believe, you know, where I believe they, they taught another religion. At the time, they were polytheistic. They had many gods, many idols. And of course, that's one of the things that uh, Yahweh, the one true God, is against. So it's very difficult for Moses to believe in that, in the context where he grew, the expectations of him. But he believed. And because of that belief, because of that faith, he had this assurance of things hoped for. He had this conviction, deep belief of things not seen. He held on to the promises of God for Israel and for those who believe in him. Hebrews 11, 6. It says here, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. God is the source of everything. All he's asking for you is to believe. His resources, his provision is all for free. By grace, don't buy it. You cannot achieve it. It all comes from God. But what he's asking is believe. You believe, right? You believe, right? So verse 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So Moses believed that God exists. And he believes that God is going to give him reward for obeying him. Now in Greek, notice, uh, by the way, notice the last part. Let's read verse 26 again. Hebrews eleven twenty six. Hebrews eleven twenty six. it says here, Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Now, notice the term looking. The word in Greek, the word looking to there, suggests concentrated attention on something. Concent concentrated attention on something. That's what looking to means there. The word used there uh, suggests concentrated attention. While the imperfect tense denotes habitual action. So in Greek, you will see that that word means that it's a concentrated kind of attention and that the verb there is in imperfect tense, which denotes habitual action. So what does it mean? It means that Moses was concentrating on the reward. 
and he was doing it. He had been doing it, focusing on it. It's a habitual uh, uh, action on his part. He didn't think of uh, the reward only when, you know, he, he was in, I don't know, he worshipped God or maybe from time to time. Uh, he was always thinking of it. And he was concent concentrating on these things. You see, this kind of looking to the reward will help us focus and not be distracted by other things. Because I tell you, many things compete for our attention. And that's why it's very important that every day we spend time reading, studying the Word of God and praying to God to remind us. Because in fact, in our day and age, even though we have our devotions, in the middle of our devotions, our cell phone is there to distract us. <laughs> right? You're already praying. You're already spending time studying the word of God, and yet the cell phone is there. Huh? Ting. <laughs> or sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't go ting. We already have a habit to go to our cell phone. Every 30 seconds, we open our cell phone and scroll up and down, right? So even when we are doing devotions, it's very difficult. Because we already have developed this kind of <laughs> distractive uh, habit. And e but even without that, there are just so many things luring or getting our attention. So we need this kind of looking. Looking to the reward. What kind of looking? It should be a concentrated attention. And not only concentrated attention, but it should be habitual. That's why it's very important that we read the word of God every day. So that we'll be reminded when we're starting to go astray, the word of God reminds us again, convicts us. And so we go back on the right path again. We need that. That's why we also have, you know, it's good that we have our worship service. We, we, it's good that we have our prayer time. We, it's good that we have our, our Bible study online and so on and so forth. Our personal devotion to remind us always so that this world will not be able to lure us. Otherwise, we may be calling ourselves Christians. We may be paying lip service to all these things. I love you, Lord. I live for you, yada, yada, yada. And yet, we're always distracted by so many things that we're not living for God. But for Moses, you know, it says here, he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures in Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Okay? So we will have rewards. Life here is temporary. What you have here, your, all your investments here are all temporary. You will leave them, all of them. But in heaven, if you live your life for God here, God will be just to reward you. So what kinds of rewards will we receive in heaven? Basically two things. One, incorruptible crown. I'll just point out the two major things. Incorruptible crowns. So James chapter 1, verse 12, it says here, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. If you persevere in the midst of your trial, though it's very difficult, you know, there are many temptations and trials, but you still hold on to your faith in God, you still follow God, you still live for him, make the right choices, you know, it says here, you will receive the crown of life. Some Bible interpreters are saying, oh, the crown of life means life. You will, you know, by persevering, you will be proving that you have genuine faith, so you will have life, eternal. Mm -hmm. Others are saying, ah, uh, it's a real literal crown. Because remember, the Bible tells us, we will cast our crowns at his feet. Okay? Uh, I have a feeling that maybe both are true. We also have a literal crown, what represents, what represents the, the life, right? That's one of the rewards, right? First Peter chapter 5, verse 2 to 4. First Peter chapter 5, verse 2 to 4, another example. Shepherd, this is for pastors, leaders, church leaders. It says here, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. 
Wow. It's very difficult to become a church leader. I would rather be a member, honestly. <laughs> right? So I really don't understand why some people have this, you know, dream, ambition to become a pastor. If your dream and ambition is to become a pastor because you are so dedicated to the Lord, okay. Okay, right? But you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a missionary. Just to worship God, you serve Him. But for people who, I really want to be a pastor, I want to be a missionary, sometimes I, there's a question, I put a question mark on the motivation. Because the truth is, many past people who have been called to be a pastor, they're genuinely called to be a pastor, don't want to. Case in point, Moses. At first he wanted to, <laughs> but after 40 years in the wilderness, the Lord appeared to him in a burning bush, he said no. No way, not me. I'm not qualified. Send someone else. It's not easy. Right? But if the Lord called you, if you faithfully serve the Lord, it says here, you, uh, when the chief shepherd appears, the chief shepherd of the church is God, Jesus Christ. We are just under shepherds. I'm just an under shepherd. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Say another crown. Crown of glory. So that's one kind of rewards we will receive in heaven for faithful service, incorruptible crowns. Number two, and the last, spheres of authority and special responsibilities in God's kingdom. Another form of reward for faithful service. Spheres of authority and special responsibilities in God's kingdom. So in God's kingdom, you think of the kingdom of God as like a country. Do you know that angels have hierarchies? And also thus evil spirits, right? They have hierarchies. Angels, those who are still in heaven, have not rebelled against God. They, they also have hierarchies. So they have different spheres of responsibility. They have special responsibilities, spheres of authority, so on and so forth. We will also have the same. The Lord will organize us to serve him. We are servants of God, right? So when we get to heaven, some of us, we will receive, based on our faithfulness, we will receive spheres of authority and special responsibilities in God's kingdom. By the way, before I forget, do you know that in heaven, or when Jesus Christ comes, we Christians will rule over angels. Do you realize that? That's what the Bible says. We will rule over angels. Angels are just servants. We're above them in the end. Not now. <laughs> when Jesus Christ comes or we get to heaven, we'll rule over them. Right? We will, uh, you know, be tools, uh, ma managers under God's Authority, managing the universe, right? Uh, look at me in Matthew 25, verse 21. Matthew 25, verse 21. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. When we die or when Jesus Christ comes, he will welcome us. He will say, enter into the joy of your master. Welcome, my good and faithful servant. And he said, well done and good faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So listen to this. There will be a lot of reversals in heaven. Those people who were very successful here, running big companies, so on and so forth, rich, powerful, but were not really, if they were believers, but they were not faithful believers, you know, in heaven, they will not, maybe they will just be regular guys there. Those who were faithful will receive more. Right? But of course, here we think, oh, I want to be a CEO. <laughs> I would rather have that. But that is short-sighted. In heaven, for all eternity, we'll have spheres of authority and special responsibilities in God's kingdom if we obey God or serve God faithfully here. Another passage, we will end with this. 
Luke 19, verse 17 to 19. Luke 19, verse 17 to 19. It says here, And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, You are to be over five cities. Again, if you were faithful to the things that God has given you, you use them to serve him, you will be given reward. Amen? Let me end with this quote. Uh, this is from Life Application Study Bible. And I quote, Don't forfeit eternal rewards for temporary benefits. Like Moses, be willing to make sacrifices now for greater rewards later. And here's another quote. Jim Elliot. Who among you here have heard of Jim Elliot? Jim Elliot was one of the, I think, five martyrs, missionary, American missionaries, who went to uh, Ecuador in the 50s to bring the gospel to, the, to a tribe there called the Auca Indians who were cannibals in the 1950s. Jim Elliot was one of those five missionaries who went there. Cut the long story short, they were killed by cannibals. They were still new to the area. They were killed by the Auca Indians. 1950s, very primitive at the time. Five American missionaries got killed. It's a very interesting story. If you can grab a hold of a, a biography of that, I tell you, it's insane. It's insane. It's insane, right? He died. But before he died, this is what he said. Oh, by the way, he was a brilliant guy. You know, very intelligent, graduated. I can't remember the university he gradu graduated from. Very brilliant, very promising, but he chose to be a missionary. So this is Jim Elliot, the famous missionary to Alka Indians. And he once said these words, and I quote, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Again, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He knows that he cannot keep his earthly life. He cannot keep his, you know, uh, university degree, whatever, material things. He cannot keep those. But he says he is no fool who, who, who is willing to give up those things that he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. What he cannot lose are the rewards of God in heaven. So listen to this. I don't know what's going through your mind as you're listening to me. Pastor Rich, are you speaking fiction? Pastor Rich, ah, uh, we live in 21st century. Guess what? The word of God hasn't changed. It's still the same message. And the Lord is not offering an apology for saying these weird things. <laughs> He's still holding out the challenge. Do you believe in Jesus or not? Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe his promise? If you believe, someday you will reap a rich harvest. God is a God of, you know, justice. He will reward you accordingly, right? If you don't believe, it's up to you. If you don't want to change your life, your lifestyle, your, your, your uh, direction in life, your priorities, it's up to you. It's really up to you. And everyone is, by the way, struggling. Again, I told you, I am as human as you are. I'm also looking around and seeing things you're seeing. I'm also lured by the world, whatever there is out there. Nice things to get, nice things to have. <laughs> but we have to make choices, though, again, that reflect what we really believe. Because in the end, when it's our time to be called by God to leave, that's it. No turning back.
no saying, oh, oh, I regret that I didn't live for God. Like just a few days ago, two people, I mean, I, I know many people die. I know so many people die, but I just li like to point out two people who died. One is Tim Keller. Tim Keller passed away. Pancreatic cancer. Brilliant scholar, brilliant theologian, founder, pastor of Presbyterian, uh, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York. Uh, bestseller author, very respected. He's only 72 years old, very sharp. He got uh, pancreatic cancer in June 2020. He died on the 19th. Also, the other day, we also visited someone at the hospital. Some of you know her. She also, two days after we visited her at the hospital, shared the gospel with her, led her to pray, and she was, you know, I could see the sincerity. She was even crying, repenting from her sins and believing the Lord Jesus Christ two days after she passed. Uh, Ate Eileen was with me and Ramar when we visited Brigham. Two days after, I, I remember Brother Mike. I visited with him, shared the gospel with him, led him to repent from his sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He also did that. Two days after, he passed. Right? Same thing. I, I remember that. This lady we visited died of pancreatic cancer again. Life is short, fleeting. You are accountable for your life before God. I am accountable for my life. Make your choices now. Believe in Jesus. He died for your sins. He loves you. He's not going to force you. It's you. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will make these spiritual truths a reality, not just something that we believe intellectually, but we really believe because these are truth. Your word has given out, has issued so many prophecies. Like there are 2,500 prophecies in the Bible and 2,000 of them, four, like four-fifths of the prophecies in the Bible, 2,000 prophecies have already been fulfilled. If the Bible is not your word, I don't know what it is. Because many of those prophecies are actually, you know, difficult to fulfill. In fact, many of them are things that you do not expect to happen. But because it was you, Lord God, who said those words, who pronounced those predictions, in order to show people that you are the real deal and your word is the word of God, your word, you fulfilled those. So in the end, we are left with the challenge, do we believe in you or not? And if we believe in you, are we going to live our lives accordingly? Of course, believing in you and living for you means sacrifice many times. But it's okay. Life is fleeting. It's temporary. For those of you who have not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen to this. Jesus already paid for your sins. He died for you on a cross. No religion can save you. Your own righteousness cannot save you. Because if religion can save you, he would not have come. Because there were already hundreds of religions when he came. If your good works can save you, you would not have come because you can always do good works. But God's standard is perfect. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 6.23, he says, for the wages or payment of sin is death. But he says, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So if you want to receive Jesus right now, I encourage you, repeat this prayer after me. Repeat this prayer after me. Say it to the Lord who's listening. Repeat this prayer after me where you're sitting. Father in heaven, thank you so much 
for your love for me. I do not deserve your love. I cannot save myself. I have sinned against you in many ways all these years. In thoughts, in words, and in deeds. Lord, right now, I repent my, from my sins. Forgive me, Lord, for all my sins. Right now, I make this decision to believe in Jesus, to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life. I surrender my heart to you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You died for my sins on the cross of Calvary. I receive your forgiveness. Now on, make me the person you want to be. Help me to live for you. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you made that prayer, the Bible tells in John 1, 12, you have, become, you have been given the authority, the right by God to become a child or a grandchild of God. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad everybody's here with us, praising God. And today is the offering and tithe offering. And thank you. Because now we can open the book of um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Lord, I found it. Thank you so much. Um, chapter, Second Corinthians, chapter, chapter nine, verse seven. It says, "No, every man according as it pours, pours it in his heart, so let him." No, it's not that. Sorry, I'm gonna give you the. the Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Praise the Lord. I apologize for that. I get confused. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Praise the Lord. Okay, it says, Every man according as he pure posit in his heart. So let him give. I want to give you my glass. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm so okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm sorry. Each man, each one must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or, or under compulsion. Compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. 
Praise the Lord. I have that experience about God. Um, in the Philippines, I used to give my tithes and offerings. And I see the miracles of God. And we are a farmer. I have a farm. And we do that. Less one hectare of farm. And most of people in my village, they never harvest 108 cabins of rice. And we have that. So I praise God. So tithes and offerings for the, in the church is real. It's God answering us and make us prosperity for material things and spiritual things. So... Brothers and sisters, it's time to give the tithes and offerings to our congregation. So we have a basket over here to put our offering and tithe. So please come forward. Praise the Lord. Thank you, everybody. Let's pray. Father God, we give you praise. God Jesus, we give you praise. Oh God, the Holy Spirit, we give you praise. We give you thanks, oh God. Lord, we pray that receive the offering and tithes for this day and use them, oh Lord, for your glory alone. Jesus, God bless all the people who give the offering. And we believe your word to God that you will give back and double portion whatever they give to the congregation. And thank you so much. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Everybody says amen. Still on, yes. All right, thank you, Sister Angie. When 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 you don't when you don't come up here and speak often, you can prepare all you want. When something goes wrong, you are nervous. I know this, especially when I perform for the first time in front of strangers. So I understand, and thank you for reminding me how I felt 20 years ago. Uh, Pastor Rich was talking about callings. I'm a testimony of rejecting God's calling twice. The first time, it was through a dream. I told my grandmother she was happy. I said, and I accepted the calling, but I said, I wanted to do it my way. 15 years later, I was still trying to do things my way. Didn't work out. Got called a second time through Anlin. I regarded it was through my wife. So I didn't think of anything of it. The third time, I shared it with certain individuals before I had let the congregation know. And through different individuals, every time, it was basically telling me, if you don't accept, I will keep hounding you. I will ride you until you say yes. So I know what Pastor Rich was talking about when people say, no, 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 I'm not doing this, no. And then next thing you know it, uh, all right, I might as well just do it. Might as well say yes. <laughs> so, um, yes. All right, so for our announcements, today is our congregational meeting. And on the main agenda of our congregational meeting is our election. Now, I want to make sure I don't forget anything, so I will look at Pastor Rich. We do not have a care group today. The congregational meeting is going to be after our fellowship dinner, and that's when we're going to start. We do have our Power, Power Connect, which is a, uh, basically a prayer group online, prayer meeting online, 
and it's Tuesdays and Fridays at 8 p.m. We have our care group meeting on two days, Wednesday and Friday. Wednesdays is from 7 o'clock to whenever it ends, pretty much, 8.30. And on Friday, it's for one hour from 7 to 8 because we have our Power Connect right after. So if you are uh, willing to join any of, any of them, uh, let us know, and we will uh, send you a link. Is there anything I'm forgetting? All right. Uh, we got Memorial Day coming up, Children's Day coming up, Father's Day coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, again, we don't have a care group after the worship service. The worship service, we will have our fellowship dinner right away. Because after fellowship dinner, we will have our annual church meeting. Shall we all rise for our blessing time? Let's pray for our family. If your family is here with you, come together to one place and use the next five minutes to bless one another. Bless one another. And for those whose family are not here, you may band with other people. Yeah, you pray for one another, okay? Pray for your spiritual health, spiritual growth. Pray for the uh, work, the studies perhaps of students, good health, and other things. Children of God, let's receive the blessing of our Heavenly Father. May the Lord cause a special favor to rest upon you and your family. May the Lord keep you and your family from all kinds of dangers in the coming days. May the Lord heal you and your family physically, spiritually, emotionally, and even relationally. And may the Lord provide you and your family with everything that you need in all areas of your life so that you will be able to live a victorious life. To the glory of God, for his joy, as well as ours. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen and amen. God bless you. Praise God. Okay, we'll have our fellowship dinner.